thank you, Padaniel, for carrying us through the Slido poll. It's really interesting to gauge opinion of the group of participants and people who have joined us from far and wide. And it certainly, as you said, will set the tone of our discussions and provide us uh, some more insights into these uh, relevant topics. So our next session is a panel discussion, and we are very honored to have four eminent members to join this panel. I'll provide a brief introduction of uh, them, and then we will start with the presentations and, and uh, their uh, inputs or insights. So first we have Professor Gusti Ansari. He is a professor and chair of master's program of environment, soil science department at Tanjung Pura University. He's also a director of the Center of Wetlands and People in the Biodiversity. He's an expert in tropical peatland and has published large number of scientific publications related to tropical peatlands and climate change. We are very honored to have you here with us today. Next member of this panel is Dr. Yuti Aryani. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Nanyang Technological University. She has also been part of our uh, webinar series that Padiniel mentioned uh, previous year. Her research focuses on the role of community participation in peatland restoration projects within Indonesia. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Yuti. Uh, our third panel member is Dr. Michael Brady. He is principal scientist at C4 and leads the value chain finance and investment team. He manages programs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And his program or his team is responsible for achieving sustainable value chains and commodity supply in forest landscape and developing business models that deliver improved social and environmental outcomes. Thank you for your time, Dr. Brady. And last but not least, we have Dr. Harry Pornomo uh, as our panel member. He has a PhD in forest management and policy, as well as MSc in computer science, which was interesting to note. I just came to know about this today. So good. Uh, and uh, he conducts research on criteria and indicators of sustainable forest management, adaptive collaborative management of forest, company community partnership and forest governance. And we are very happy that you've joined uh, here on this uh, panel, uh, Dr. Purnomo. So without further ado, let's get our uh, discussion started. We have about 40 minutes. Some time may be used by me for your introduction. So what we'll do is we will have a round of uh, a small presentation, which could be with slides or just as a monologue uh, for, for each panel member. And then we will have a more sort of an interactive discussions. I will also be willing to take any questions or any comments that is coming from audience as you are sharing your perspectives and insights. And we will follow the same order like we had in Slido poll in terms of the four aspects. And we'll start with the biophysical aspect. And so I invite Professor Christian Sari to start our discussions. Over to you, Professor Christian. Thank you very much, Dr. Rupes. Uh, so I would like to, to share screen first. Okay, I hope you see my screen now. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a honor for me to give this presentation. So, so my title of this presentation is Pit Restoration, Making Tropical Pit Swamp Forest Ecosystem Alive. So I'm Gusti Ansari from Tanjung Pura University. So, as you know, the tropical peatland as a wetland forest ecosystem that contain living creatures. Kita tahu bahwa lahan gemuk tropis adalah suatu ekosistem uh, hutan lahan basah dan juga menjadi tempat uh, tinggal dari makhluk seperti flora fauna seperti orang utan. Kemudian juga ada tanah gambut, ya, atau tanah organik. Ini juga meliputi ekosistem perairan atau akuatik seperti black water. Jadi kita bisa melihat hal ini sebagai uh, hutan 
rawa gambut tropis ya yang hidup dan dengan akumula tingkat akumulasi uh, zat-zat organik yang lebih tinggi dibandingkan tingkat dekomposisinya itu sendiri dan tingkat akumulasi dari zat-zat organiknya sama dengan tingkat dekomposisinya atau pembusukannya kemudian juga ada uh, lahan gambut tropis yang unliving yang tidak ada uh, kehidupannya dengan tingkat dekomposisi dari zat organik yang lebih tinggi dibandingkan akum, tingkat akumulasi dari zat organik. Jadi apa yang dimaksud dengan degradasi gambut tropis? Jadi berdasarkan uh, peraturan ada adalah gambut yang mengalami deforestasi dan juga sudah mengalami konversi. Lalu drainase, tapi bukan alami, melainkan buatan from the ground surface. The current pit fires occur and they might have period oxidation in the coastal pit area and also if uh, they have from karangas or heat forest may have a sense exposure and we if you look at the report of IRC IPCC working group 2 so in the near future 2020 until 2040 it would be an increase in pit fires and also rainfall variability that might change the productivity of vegetation of tropical pit swamp forest and also high temperature that enhances pit oxidation in particular in permafrost pitland yeah. okay so let's move on to these three principles of uh, pitland uh, restoration first like we see the, uh, the, in our fall we need to keep pitland as a wetland forest ecosystem that means high groundwater table and also high organic matter second principle is keeping pit and black water acidic as natural yeah? and the third principle is keeping both terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity native to pit swamp forest this is a three principle i think yeah? this is very uh, crucial and then according to our uh, regulation the minister the environment and forestry degree number p14 year 2017 they have uh, listed data and information that we need to assess the pitland of course the coordinate groundwater table land copper the existence of protected flora and fauna the drainage water quality inundation type yeah of course pit thickness is very important in Indonesia pit thickness all pit greater than uh, 300 centimeter depth uh, consider as protected pitland and also we need to know proportion of organic matter pit degradation condition characteristic of mineral substratum and also characteristic of soil and pyrite uh, uh, or sulfidic material underneath the pit and from my point of view so as required in this uh, webinar so first of all what to do or what we need to do the pit restoration i think we ha at least we need to have four criteria or four indicator first of all we need to have a pit map in this pit map we, of course we need to have the coordinate of pitland hydrological unit so it's quite easy maybe to do uh, to, to have this and elevation of pit surface is quite uh, maybe from medium to hard is difficulty land cover is easy land use is easy pit thickness is could be easy if the pit is shallow could be hard too if the pit is remote and damp and drainage is easy fire history can be easy can be not so easy and then groundwater table according to our regulation must be below 40 centimeter all the year it's very hard to achieve this and number three selected properties of pit soil or histosol decomposition scale if you use spawn force is quite easy pH is easy to measure bulk density can be not so easy yeah because we need to know the volume how to collect the sample and then percentage percentages of total organic carbon and nitrogen can be uh, difficult if we don't have the elemental analyzers yeah and then we need to know organic matter and ash content is easy we use just oven and furnace and maybe we need to know the iron concentration uh, it's not that so difficult and revegetation can be very easy can be very difficult 
because as we know that the vegetation is very uh, not very much trial in our peatland restoration uh, program right now so we need to focus more on this and we come to the optional uh, requirement here so maybe we need to measure subsidence rate so his long term yeah maybe every six months and then if we have the equipment we can measure greenhouse gases co2 yeah uh, ch4 and 2o and then we need to observe water quality water ph salinity dissolved oxygen oxygen dissolved organic carbon and also iron in the water and lastly monitoring of flora and fauna it is very important is long term so both uh, flora fauna on terrestrial and also aquatic ecosystem so this is the my uh, my thought and this is my last slide give me this so restoration of the graded peatland is absolutely needed yeah and then restoration needs time and let natural restoration processes take place so it's very long term and from an ecological point of view peatland restoration is not only to let the tropical peat forest ecosystem alive but also to provide economic products and environmental commodities or services to humans i think that's all my presentation thank you very much for your attention i uh, return to uh, dr rupes thank you thank you very much Pakisti. Uh, this was very succinct and uh, definitely on time we appreciate it and I think your key messages are very punchy and true to the spirit of our discussions today. The peatland restoration won't be possible overnight. It will take time. It will take continuous efforts. And during that time, we need to monitor to, to see where our uh, success, where we are headed, if there are any sort of interventions needed. So this is all our discussion about today. How do we do that monitoring while restoration efforts are being made? So continuing those discussions, uh, we have heard from uh, Pagusti on the biophysics and ecological aspects of peatland and peatland restoration. And uh, now we switch over to the social aspects. And uh, may I invite Dr. Yuti Ariani to share her thoughts on social aspects of peatland restoration. Over to you, Yuti. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for having me here. I'm very happy that I can uh, be part of a continuous uh, process. Um, so I'm going to present uh, my work uh, as part of my um, position as a postdoctoral in Nanyang Technological University, and I'm going to look at the criteria and indicators from a social perspective. And as you may already kind of like guess from the polling as well, it's kind of like tricky uh, to talk about the social aspect because uh, what uh, there's like a lot of uh, variety and also like diversity things. So I start my uh, presentation with a question like, how can we standardize criteria and indicators uh, be implemented in a diverse settings? Because uh, when um, I did my uh, field work in the villages, uh, there are many social aspects that cannot be compared like apple to apple uh, between villages. And um, yeah, through this uh, presentation, um, I'm hoping we can reflect together on how we can have like a comparisons, but also like prefer uh like before and after because once we have like a general idea we kind of like lost on the identity of the villages as well but i think it's still important to have like a general um indicators and uh, we will reflect uh, later on so this is um like one of the regulations that uh related with uh, peatland uh, restoration in indonesia this is ministry of uh, environment and forestry so uh, there's always like, a, if you're talking about the villages, there's always like a combination between like top down approach and bottom up uh, approach. Uh, so uh, based on the regulation, uh, it says like uh, there are many uh, like um, regulations to, to have like a peatland restoration project. And, um, but there's also like a lot of problem uh, based on what's happening uh, on the field. 
so this is like from from uh, literatures were saying that there's like a conflict and and integrations of rewetting and revitalization activities with village development plan. Uh, so when there's like a youth and restoration project coming from the governments, uh, so it's like. Uh, quite standardized um, because it's uh, usually like a peatland uh, project is being called for one year. And then sometimes it's clash uh, with the village development plans. And there's also like a lack of knowledge of positive and negative impact of ecotourism locally. So sometimes in a uh, peatland restoration project, uh, they uh, promote like a ecotourism where people can see the peatland and how uh, it's good for the environment and how to deal and interact with peatland. But then uh, it's create like uh, it's backfire the plan because then people start to coming and it start to kind of like um, uh, destroy the peatland as well. So there's still like a lack of knowledge and there's also like an ongoing community use of kennels. So uh, in my uh, field work, I uh, found that um, there's this uh, Islam restorations where the rewetting needs to follow like a specific design. Uh, so what happened to the uh, at the field is like uh, they kind of like did uh, what the design said because uh, to kind of like avoid corruptions, they need to follow a standardized uh, like weight and also like depth and also like the materials that they're using. But then after the project end, they just like uh, reconstruct the, the canals block. And the reason for that is because they need the, the canals to transport their sagu. Uh, so there's this kind of uh, nuance uh, in the field uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, as a social scientist, um, the question is always about like, how can we, in, uh, increase like participations, uh, but then in the field, there's always like a contestations between like, oh, we need to uh, kind of like be accountable to the design. Uh, and then uh, there's no room uh, for modifications. Whereas like, uh, like during our uh, my discussions with the decision maker, they said, oh, like the, the community can redesign, but there's no communications uh, in the field. So uh, this ones need to be addressed as well. So uh, some of the interviews that I got, uh, because uh, the idea of restoration to be sustainable, then it need to be include like uh, various actors and then like uh, community participations. And when the community also support the Pithen uh, restoration project, they will uh, kind of like maintain it. But uh, based on the on the on uh, like uh, some of the interviews, they said like once the projects end, it returns the land management to the Nature Conservation Agency, not to BRG. If the project is done in the community land, we return it to the owner. It's different than, uh, this is another project uh, from an uh, international NGO that has no affiliations and therefore didn't last long. We are going to get another revegetation project and the fund that I'm going uh, to manage is 1.5 billion. So this uh, response is basically uh, mentioning like, oh, we got this project and then we did uh, all the plantations. We didn't um, like, we basically follow all the procedures, uh, but then once the project end, we will just like uh, hand it over. So the idea of like community participation uh, in this uh, particular like statement is just like we're, we're doing a uh, peatland restoration for the sake of being paid uh, for doing the project. And there's also like uh, another respondent saying like um, when the head of BRG came to our village, he offered fund to support peatland restoration as long as we form a group and develop a plan. So uh, this, statement, this statement basically uh, kind of like representing how uh, the local community uh, follow the government's rule because to get like the funding from the governments, they need to create like a proposal. And even like during the interviews, they also say like, hey, you know what? Like we are villagers, we, we, we this is like uh, our first experience uh, writing a proposal. So it's also creating like a hierarchy uh, in the villages on who can access the, the grant uh, for doing the peatland restoration. And this is uh, this kind of like creating um like an elite local elite but uh from my experience the presence of a uh, local elite is also very important uh, in the sense that they are the ones who's doing the project they really know what to do and they really can write all the report that it's needed uh, for the accountability for the project um but then we also need to be careful because as uh, they said like there's a corruption in here uh 
at the end they asked me to sign an amount bigger than the one I received. So whenever uh, these local people involved in the project, and they need to be signed like a like a like a piece of paper. And then by 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 signing this, they will receive some money. But then apparently, like the the money that they receive are smaller than the one that they signed for. So there are these uh, cases. Uh, so this is uh, kind of like the indicators, uh, general indicators that can be translated differently based on the different situations at the village level. Uh, so um, based on the workshop that we had like earlier in 2020, um, like C4 and uh, with all the support from uh, the collaborators, uh, we had like developed like indicators. So for social capital, it's important to have like gender equality. But again, like uh, when we uh, when I went to to the village, then the idea of gender equality is also kind of um, it need to be seen like critically um, because even if we promote like inclusiveness, uh, the idea of gender is like oh we have to have like a certain percentage of women inside the meeting, but they don't have any voice. Or there are cases where the funding is really going for like a woman's group, um, but the way they got the funding is also quite interesting because I, I've been called by the head of the village and uh, he asked me whether I want uh, to have this restoration uh, project uh, and at the end it didn't work out because um, they they create the, uh, they plant uh, red ginger and then uh, it didn't uh, work out because of, of flooding. So the interactions between like the social and the ecological aspect is also very important. But then sometimes uh, when we're talking to the villager, it's really about becoming like a social element and they kind of like um, ignore uh, the ecological aspect. And there's also like a idea about social welfare. So it's need to have like the local community need to have like water and health security, access to education, access to uh, health services uh, and also like uh, in terms of social cohesiveness because there are uh, many areas where there's a lot of immigrations uh, due to um, transmigrations uh, since the 70s but also like later on because there's many opening uh, of the forest and out migrations and benefit sharing and benefit sharing is also kind of like highlighting who benefit from the restoration project. And I think like probably Pa Harry Purnomo will talk more about the governance side of this. So the key message yeah. is to go beyond technical procedures because at the end, like the 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 villagers really afraid of the uh, of the regulation. Like oh, really really need to to focus uh, on what is being designed and they cannot reconstruct it. Uh, and to focus on social cohesion because uh, at the end, it's really about like how the local community deals with the uh, restoration project and the local elite as a double. Beauty, you have 30 seconds to, okay. to wrap it up. Yeah. yeah, and the impossibility of marginal people uh, with degraded land is sustainable peatland. It's just like impossible. Uh, they need more support and continuity of peatland projects depend on all stakeholders. And sometimes you cannot have all, you have to prioritize. And and yeah, and sometimes you need to, to focus uh, on ecology or the economy. Thank you very much. Sorry for the... <laughs> no, no worries. It, it was exciting discussion and we will touch upon this. We'll return back uh, in more discussion session. So we will uh, touch upon these things. Uh, that is our experience too from previous webinars that these uh, socioeconomic and governance aspects are a little more entangled and need much more discussion, dialogue, participation, and sometimes uh, there is no straight way forward so i believe with our this kind of deliberation and learnings uh, like what you shared from the field we can find some ways and hopefully criteria and indicators as an approach can imbibe those learnings and can be refined to at least give some semblance that uh, when people restoration is conducted or carried out these aspects are not missed out so with that i would like to invite uh, uh, Michael Brady to share his views. Michael, we have about seven minutes for you. Okay, thanks Rupesh. Well, I'm gonna talk about uh, economics and uh, it's very relevant and based on the overarching principle of a viable, sustainable peatland-based uh, economy, focus on economy. So the economics is balanced uh, within the three other sustainability aspects we're hearing about now, biophysical, social, and governance. 
uh, all related to restoration and addressed in, the, in today's webinar. I thought I would review uh, some economic basics relating to scaling up restoration. And I wanted to talk about three basic elements of economics. Uh, the first is costs of restoration, uh, that uh, costs are efficient, and more importantly, the costs are actually known. So we know what restoration requires and the cost for those requirements. The second is payments or funding for restoration. Uh, the source of budgets to uh, pay for restoration, whether this is coming from public uh, funding, uh, private funding, or a combination, uh, or, or you know, what we typically call blended funding. And then that's uh, critical for uh, providing necessary funds for restoration. How we generate revenues uh, from restoration. So the contribution to, for example, livelihoods. Will restored areas lead to uh, alternative livelihood generation, uh, income generation? Uh, finance, uh, a, a key aspect to budgeting. Uh, will funds for restoration be borrowed? Uh, will earnings or investment from outside sources be used to fund restoration? So finance is, is critical. And again, public or private. Uh, we can even consider investment for restoration. Uh, again, public and private to build up operations or to purchase, for example, uh, investment products. We can see uh, investments such as equity in uh, restored areas. And along with these uh, funding issues goes collateral. If, uh, if restoration is financed or if there's investments, obviously there's going to be a need for collateral. And this can be in the form of land or, or movable assets. And this is more focused on uh, commercial funding. A third aspect is, uh, and I think Gusti referred to this, as a competing use of funds. So we've got uh, what I think we're mainly talking about is assisted restoration, uh, which has an intensive requirement for funding. But we've also got natural restoration, uh, less, less intensive. But over the longer term, I, I think we're seeing that natural restoration is a viable approach. Although in the case of peatlands, uh, if water tables are not actively restored, natural restoration may, may not be effective. But both of these restoration approaches uh, should also be compared to conservation uh, of intact peatlands. Is it, uh, you know, we, we need to balance out investments in restoration versus investments in conserving the remaining um, natural intact peatlands. And I, I refer back to the discussions earlier on the peat hydrological units where uh, restoring and conserving peatlands uh, is complex and that we, we need to, re to refer and, you know, and consider the entire ecosystem uh, or hydrological unit. Um, another aspect to this is identifying cost savings by avoiding future impacts. So current, you know, the, the uh, short-term impacts of fire, uh, emissions, erosion, siltation, uh, there, there can be considerable cost savings, which needs to be balanced um, looking at the economics. So these co economic concepts are well addressed in the recent uh, C4 ICRAF working paper on effective monitoring and amount of peatlands restoration. Uh, the paper includes uh, five uh, criteria and many, many indicators. Uh, these can be uh, challenging and costly to monitor and evaluate. I, I certainly agree with the five criteria selected uh, under the economics heading but there are uh, many, many indicators identified and these can pose a challenge to select. 
So among the five criteria, um, which of the many indicators identified are essential and most feasible in my view? Well, under criteria one, sustainable and just value chains, I've uh, identified five key indicators that I think are most, most important uh, from a, an investment perspective. So provision of raw material, processed goods, value addition, wetland-based small and medium enterprise development, and wetland-dependent site, site industries. Under criteria two, which focuses on economic incentives for peatland restoration, I thought uh, one of the indicators was particularly relevant, and this is return on invested capital. Under criteria three, which uh, focuses on wealth, um, I thought there were at least four key indicators related to revenue or uh, proportion of sustainable products and services generated, household income, annual household savings, and sustained long-term revenue growth. Under criteria four, which uh, focuses on economic valuation of services. I would add uh, products and services. And uh, I had identified two key indicators, which I think are most important. These are valuing ecosystem services and cost savings due to avoided environmental disasters. As I mentioned earlier, things like fire, siltation, cost of haze. Under the uh, last, the fifth criteria on human resources, I thought uh, there were two key indicators from my perspective, the job and workforce creation due to wetland-based enterprises and improvements in human capital. So in, in conclusion, um, economic considerations are essential for su successful restoration uh, basics. Uh, priority criteria are important to decide on and must be verified through field testing. Value of products is uh, as important as value of services and should be included. Uh, often value of products is easier to identify than services. Ongoing management, monitoring and evaluation are critical for successful investment. And the costs of management, monitoring, and evaluation must be provided uh, in planning and costing. So that's a, a key element of, of cost. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you for covering these economic aspects very clearly and also providing feedback on our working paper where we have a list of highlighted, a list of these criteria and indicators uh, for all these four aspects. I think perhaps one can uh, identifying and recognizing challenges to sort of monitor or measure all the indicators, what Pagusti was sharing, like, you know, easy, difficult or possible kind of uh, some scheme would be helpful to prioritize which indicators can be easy to sort of get the information and measure in the field and what indicators, although very relevant, but might be really difficult to obtain the data. So those could be done at sort of a lesser or, or a longer time interval and the easier indicators can be tapped at a shorter time duration, something like that. So we'll have this discussion, but before, uh, before we start those discussion, I'd like to invite Dr. Purnomo to share his views on the governance aspects of peatland restoration. The floor is over, Dr. Purnomo, in about seven minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Rupes. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to talk uh, several things. First, on the, the strength, opportunity, challenges, as well as my feedback to the, 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 the poll. Yeah, very interesting, actually. First, on the, the strength, uh, the CI and I approved, it is uh, very powerful to develop standard. Yeah. We have a standard for uh, good forest management and then becoming a certification, criterion indicator. Yeah. So um, it, is, uh, it is good to, to uh, gather here to develop. Yeah. 
to understand what the ideal peatland restoration and sometimes the ideal of restored peatland. Sometimes there's a difference between peatland restoration and restored peatland. The first one. The second one is this opportunity to, to us yeah, to unify, to understand yeah, the performance of uh, peatland restoration everywhere in yeah, Indonesia and, and, and beyond. Yeah. And also to provide model, if it is good, yeah, uh, we, uh, according to our criteria, it is good, can becoming a learning site yeah, for everybody to, to understand. Yeah. And also uh, important to, to talk about how to score. Yeah? It's not black and white, but there is a, a scoring, I think a lot of technique to have been developed for scoring the criteria and, and indicator. And uh, the third one, I think is uh, part of my uh, most of my work is the challenges. So if we are talking about standard based on what, usually we categorize three dimension yeah whether we are measuring the the input what kind of regulation we have yeah? or we can we measure the, the process yeah? whether the regulation is being implemented it is a process and sometimes we uh, measure the outcomes yeah? whether the regulation able to uh, to change the behavior so we, we need to be clear we, we are measuring the input the process, as well as in biophysics and social, is the process. Sometimes we master the process. The behavior is not really uh, back, but it is uh, in a way to be something uh, better, as well as the uh, avoiding emission. First, uh, based on what dimension and also what level. But then when we talk uh, social and also uh, um, governance, whether we are talking about landscape yeah, or PHU with hydrological unit or we are talking about jurisdiction because a lot of uh, regulation I think based on the jurisdiction is Kabupaten A uh, province B yeah, it's not based on the uh, uh, pitland hydrological unit the governance of a PHU is not clear to me yeah. But the governance of jurisdiction is very strong yeah, and mandated by, by people yeah, who has mandate to uh, regulate, yeah, to govern one PHU. BRGM is no. Yeah. So now it's very clear the, uh, the jurisdiction. Yeah. So we need to be, to be clear. Yeah. And also, uh, I think it's what uh, Mbak Yuki mentioned about uh, diversity of plates. It's whatever standard we have should be adaptive yeah, to the place, to the community, to the culture there. Yeah. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to, to if it is uh, strict, yeah, having criteria indicator in Sumatra the same uh, as we have in Papua, for instance, or in Pahang, yeah, Matang, in, in Malaysia, Sarawak, Sabah, yeah, should be a kind of uh, uh, diversity. Also, we develop for whom yeah, this kind of uh, standard, yeah, whether it is for government, for community, for private sector, for for donor, yeah. so we need to to uh, to understand who will use uh, this uh, this uh, um, criteria indicator. Yeah. Uh, and my last part is uh, related to the, the pooling. I think it's very interesting, particularly on the uh, governance. Just perhaps uh, if we are talking about regulation, yeah. regulation is. I don't know whether it's enough. There are many, many regulations in Indonesia. Yeah? If you develop kind of network of regulation, you confuse yourself. <laughs> yeah, every every month, every year, we have new regulation. Yeah? So it is lack of regulation or lack of uh, implemented regulation. Yeah? Rule of law. Yeah? It's, it's not uh, having new regulation, many regulations better than having less regulation. To be some many, many regulations. It's difficult for me eh, as Indonesia to follow eh, regulation coming from uh, Ministry of uh, Forestry and Environment, from BRGM, the ministry is under the minister, and also to local governments, so many. Eh. So we need to differentiate between regulation, number of regulation, and rule of law, how the regulation implemented. Eh. 
also organization we need to differentiate between many organization yeah and also institution yeah. institution means organization as well as rule of the game yeah. whether we have rule of the game in particular khg or phu yeah, rule of the game rule of the game can be based on the existing regulation or based on the uh, common understanding based on the customary uh, institution based on the local institution to me it doesn't really matter whether it is government or or <coughs> agreement among people yeah as long as it is uh, it is implemented and enforced yeah. and also the accountability who are accountable yeah. for instance and in, in particular uh, uh, PHU yeah whether BRGM or Kepala Desa yeah. because when we talk about the economy aspect I think a lot of uh, people talking about the household yeah, income yeah. household is very small yes yeah. mostly related to the village yeah. it's not related to the what, half million hectare of a pitland hydraulic unit so scale matter to me yeah, whether we are talking about a million or talking about a village and my last point is also because it is government this power who control the the restoration yeah? whether government control the restoration let the restoration or community yeah? so who who has a power there or whether they have a balance power or dominated by elite yeah? to me this is different yeah? who who dominate the uh, restoration activity yeah? Uh, even in one uh, committee base can be uh, dominated by two or three local elites. It is a, a problem of uh, governance. And the last one is uh, corruption. Yeah. Corruption. Corruption is uh, who, who control the corruption there. Yeah. Corruption is related to abuse of power. Yeah. Uh, someone who has uh, uh, much powerful, there's no control and becoming... Uh, becoming uh, dominant and, and 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 get a lot of money from uh, restoration without uh, clear accountability i think that's all uh, my my point Rupes. Uh, thank you over to you Rupes. thank you uh, Fahari. and uh, what is interesting hearing all four of you talking about these uh, aspects and the issues or challenges that one one kind of encounters when you try to tease tease these apart um, just reminiscing about what Pahari just mentioned about who is regulating who is controlling who is enforcing uh, what is the role of institutions what is the role of organizations uh, how can we make these uh, process more inclusive how we can make them diverse diverse so that they incorporate uh, local traditions local uh, wisdom uh, these are, I think, very uh, practical and important challenges faced when we talk about wheatland restoration. And the idea for this panel discussion, and I am afraid we are a little bit over time, but it was important to hear all panel, panel members be able to share their, those thoughts. But if I, I can take maybe two or, 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 or maybe four, four extra minutes of our time and can ask each panel member to just say briefly maybe in 30 or 35 seconds in terms of um, criteria and indicator approaches uh, focusing on your uh, aspect what would you think is 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 a positive aspect if we can use criteria and indicators approach to monitor these peatland restoration what's your opinion and your thought in 30 seconds over to you, Pat Christy, first one. Thank you, uh, Rubes. Yeah. It's very important uh, question. And of course, like we agree that we need to have uh, the pitland is uh, moist or wet. So we need to keep the water table high. And the second one is we need the pitland restoration to be uh, repetition. Yeah vegetation is lacking right now it is important issue so we need the vegetation back in order to return the function of the pitland ecosystem but of course needs time yeah okay. thank you Pakistan. 
Yeah, yeah. Th th this relates to our opinion poll too, if I recall in slider poll, under the vegetation, it was not ranked very high, it was below educate. So this aligns well with what your thoughts are. Um, yeah. Over to you, Yuti, you have any thoughts, maybe 30 seconds? Yeah, I mean, like related to the indicators, I think like power relationship is number one. But then the question is like uh, resonate with uh, pa Harry uh, just mentioned about like who owns the Gitlander restoration um, because at the end like the villagers uh, whenever the projects end they also think like oh we don't have uh, we don't get money anymore so uh, accountable to whom uh, so like if um, you ask me to ask one then it's like the power power to decide power of ownership and uh, power to participate as well. Thank you. That's that's very relevant, and and I take that point. Um, over to you, Michael. Your thoughts. Sure. Well, I, I did go through uh, the five criteria uh, and identified uh, what I thought were measurable uh, or more most easily measurable and uh, and important uh, indicators. But I would like to go back to my comments about the very basic issues of. Uh, restoration, you know, assisted versus natural restoration, and the substantial cost differences. Um, and, and I think that's now emerging as a, uh, as a key discussion, uh, you know, to what degree is natural uh, restoration, uh, you know, should we be prioritizing that, and that has big cost implications. And then again, versus the uh, alternative of, of conservation, a focus on conserving uh, un, you know, unmanaged or um, intact peatlands as well. Thank you. Thank you. Paheri, I know you kind of summarized a lot of things, but you have something that's high on your priority. Yeah, um, my priority uh, was uh, using nested CNI approach. It's not one CNI, so scale matters whether you are at the village level or at the PHU or at the jurisdiction level. Yeah? So we need to understand that because uh, committee sometimes is not relevant. We talk about half million hectare and you are talking about measuring the household income. Yeah? It's not connected at all. Yeah? And the second one, of course, the, the list can be as common in, in Governance, you, you, you have to find the, the voice, the participation, accountability and transparency, equity, inclusiveness, effectiveness of a government, as well as uh, control of uh, corruption. And all whatever criteria should be able to modify, adaptive yeah, to a specific level. If you are talking about participatory as the uh, stakeholders there, to develop, maybe not the indicator, but the verifier that relevant to social as well as culture as well as my special things there. Thank you, Rupes. Thank you. Um, so this is very invigorating discussion and a lot of learnings for sure. This will go into our manual too. And I take your point, by it's important to see the. Uh, the level that you are operating, whether it's a, it's a PHU level, whether it's a community level, or it's a larger level, it's important. So with that, I end uh, this discussion for now. Um, and I thank all of our panel members. And I would like to apologize to Daniel that I kind of uh, took this session and uh, used some of the time. But without further ado, I'll hand over the next session. To